The Vulture and the Little Girl, also known as the Struggling Girl, is a photo taken by South African photojournalist Kevin Carter. It was captured on March 26, 1993 and first published in the New York Times. The picture depicts what was then thought to be an exhausted girl hunched over almost into a squatting fetal position and her head to the ground. She's struggling to get to a UN feeding center a ways out of frame. You can see the ribs and bony shoulder blades. She's exhausted, tired, malnourished, starving, and the heat is beating down on her. Behind her, with its beak pointing almost directly toward her head, a vulture has landed, waiting as if stalking its potential prey. When this photo first came out, the reader reaction was intense. It not only drew a huge number of attention and awareness to the famine in Sudan, but it also brought a great deal of negativity towards the photographer Kevin Carter as well. People wanted to know the fate of the girl in the photo. Did she make it to the feeding station? Did she die in that very spot she collapsed? Did the photographer put down his camera and help her in any way? This controversy only grew when, a few months later, Carter would win the Pulitzer Prize for the photo. Then, at the end of July of 1994, Kevin Carter would take his own life. Let's take a step back for a second to see how we got here. In the early 1990s, Sudan was engaged in a decades-long civil war. Not only did the country have an enormous budget deficit, but a large national debt as well. As the country tried to pull itself out of its economic mess and ruin, famine struck. The United Nations would try and help by setting up and establishing food centers and facilities to help aid the citizens in learning other ways to grow crops and stimulate their economy. When Carter published the now infamous photo, it brought further attention to Sudan and shed light on how additional effort should be put into helping the people there. And although it did bring awareness to the extreme poverty and state of those in Sudan, it also raised ethical issues to photojournalists like Carter. Many asked, why didn't he just put down the camera and do something? Was it just emotional detachment? After all, emotional detachment helps photojournalists witness countless tragedies while doing their job. Carter himself witnessed numerous executions, shootings, beatings, stabbings, and murders on a day-to-day -day basis. Carter was from Africa, born in Johannesburg in 1960. He came from a middle-class family and lived in an all-white locality during the time of apartheid. He often saw blacks in his area being arrested for living there illegally. After completing high school, he became a pharmacist and joined the Air Force, but after four years, he was beaten by servicemen after having defended a mess hall waiter. He left the service without telling anyone and restarted his life as a disc jockey going by the name of David. Later, after witnessing the 1983 Church Street bombings in Pretoria, he decided to pursue a new career path in photojournalism. It began, innocently enough, shooting sports for the Johannesburg Star, but his photos began to expose the racial mistreatment during the time of apartheid. He wanted to focus his efforts and have the affliction of the world around him reflected in his photographs. He felt he needed to document the treatment of blacks by whites, but also between black ethnic groups as well, such as those between the Kosas and Zulas. He, along with a select group of other photojournalists, would head straight into the action of the ongoing conflicts to get the best shots. A South African newspaper would nickname these men, Ken Osterbrook, Joa Silva, Greg Mirinovich, and Kevin Carter, the Bang Bang Club, referring to the act of going out to the South African townships to cover the extreme violence happening there. In regards to the vulture photo, there are a few things to consider. Carter took an assignment in Sudan where he spent his time touring villages of starving people. He was surrounded by Sudanese soldiers who were there to keep him from interfering in an effort to prevent spreading disease to people already in a weakened state. There's also a code of ethics in photojournalism restricting interference with people, the scene, or the surroundings. As told to Time Magazine, Carter said he wandered into the open bush and heard a soft, high-pitched, whimpering sound. He saw what he believed to be a tiny girl trying to make her way to the feeding center. As he crouched to photograph her, a vulture landed in view. He was careful not to disturb the bird and positioned himself for the best possible angle. 
He waited around for about 20 minutes for the bird to spread its wings. However, it never did. He took his photos and then chased the bird away and watched as the little girl resumed her struggle. Carter said he went and sat under a tree, lit a cigarette, and cried. Though at the time the child was believed to be a girl, we now know, as confirmed by the father, that Kong Yong, the child's name, was a boy. Nyung's father recognized his son from the famous photo and did confirm that he was able to reach the feeding station eventually. However, Nyung died some 14 years later from malaria. Carter was told not to touch the child in fear of spreading disease and did what he was instructed to do by the UN. Keep in mind the child had a wristband on signifying that she had already been registered at the food station where her parents were already located. Be that as it may, those facts aren't meant to take away from the image or to lessen the tragedy. Instead, it gives perspective on the lasting effects that a photojournalist carries with themselves after such an assignment. Most people should have trouble comprehending how Kevin Carter and the rest of the Bang Bang Club went about doing this kind of job day after day. As it turns out, especially in Carter's case, there is indeed a toll it takes. Carter had a daily routine of cocaine and other drug abuse to help cope with his occupation's baggage and horror. He would talk to his friends about the guilt he had from not being able to save the people he photographed being killed. It all spiraled into a well of depression. This was exacerbated when his fellow Bang Bang Club member and friend, Ken Osterbrook, was shot and killed while on location. In 1994, Carter submitted his photo for consideration and he won the Pulitzer Prize. That same month, Nelson Mandela would become president of South Africa, Indian apartheid. He had focused his professional life on exposing the evils of the era of apartheid, and now it was over. He wasn't quite sure what to do next, and felt the pressure of living up to the Pulitzer he had won. While traveling on assignment for Time magazine, Carter accidentally left 16 rolls of film behind on the plane. He was never able to recover them. He was devastated, and it seemed to be the last straw for him. Less than a week later, he drove out to a park, ran a hose from the exhaust pipe into his car window, and died from carbon monoxide poisoning. Carter's story, as well as that of The Bang Bang Club, was the subject of the 2010 feature film, The Bang Bang Club. It's indeed a movie worth watching. Winning the Pulitzer Prize could have, in fact, added pressure to Carter's life. It may have added to the mounting pile of stress and guilt he accumulated over the years of documenting the atrocities and gruesome scenes of war and conflict in Africa. He had long exposed himself to the suffering of others and wasn't able to shake its lasting effects. 